turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading today in uh, verses 10 through 13 as we look at the secret of contentment, which is a pretty good topic to talk about the week of Thanksgiving. So let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Philippians 4, beginning in verse 10. Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. It's no accident that the Lord has led us to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13, the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Paul is displaying both an attitude of thanksgiving for the church of Philippi, but he's also displaying in our scripture today a dependence upon the Lord God. To understand how the Philippians have helped Paul, we need to look at a little bit of a backstory of their relationship. If you've been in church for the past several months now, you know that this letter is written by Paul from prison. Paul is in prison, and the situation in the ancient world is not like the situation of modern-day prisons that have an entire system connected with them. You want three meals a day? You know, I've often thought about this uh, when I see folks standing on the street corner. Well, you know, prison would be a great opportunity. At least you're fed and you know, it doesn't snow on you or whatever. There was no system like that in the ancient world. If your needs were to be met, your friends or your family would have to bring either food or money to you to take care of those needs. Paul serves the gospel not because of what he can get out of it. He serves the gospel of Jesus Christ because God has called him to that ministry. I find Paul being very pastorally sensitive about money matters. If you read his other letters, he will say things like this, I worked hard among you so as not to be a burden on you. Why would he say that? So that he could offer the gospel free of charge. It's true that in the ancient world, many philosophers and teachers would go into that trade simply because of what they could get out of it. It worked like this. The more people that you could get following you, the larger the paycheck would be at the end of the day. And so the popular teachers would try to gather these massive crowds around them in order to financially get something from their followers. Paul is not like that. Paul does not go into ministry as a means of gaining wealth or as a means of receiving gifts. Heard of a preacher in the Dallas area recently who stood up in front of his congregation, pretty large church, and he pointed out a particular person, and he said, I just want to draw attention to this guy and thank him because he gave me a car this week. Now, transportation is a basic need. We would agree with that. But it was interesting to me that the car that he was given was a Dodge Hellcat and not a Dodge Neon. There's great audacity in receiving a gift like that, isn't there? There's even more audacity in announcing it from the pulpit. I'm not going to attempt to try to get into this man's mind or his heart, but you can imagine that if he's willing to make an announcement like that, he's probably looking for more gifts like that. There's a tension in ministry and there's a tension in life, I think you'll find this to be true, of having enough on the one hand, but on the other hand, of not having too much. The writer of Proverbs says this, two things I ask of you, Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Now listen to this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you, and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor, 
and steal and profane the name of my God. What is the writer of Proverbs saying? The writer is saying there is a blessing in having enough, but not too much. Not too much to the extent that we would trust in those things and not in our God. Paul is deeply thankful for the church at Philippi. But I would argue he is much more thankful for the God that is working in them, that has motivated them to give. Paul's joy in all circumstances is not dependent upon the things that he has or that he does not have. Paul's joy is motivated strictly in the Lord. And that is, I think, the point of our text today. The Lord desires us to be content in all circumstances. Why? Because the Lord is the source of our joy. He's the source of our contentment. We're going to look at three things today as we march through our text. In verse 10, we're going to look at the church's concern for Paul. Verses 11 and 12, we're going to focus on Paul's contentment in any situation. And then finally, verse 13, we're going to look at Paul's confidence in any situation. So three things we're going to look at today. Concern, contentment, confidence. Let's look again at verse 10, concern. Read with me. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Paul begins verse 10 by saying, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. Again, past tense. The Philippian church had helped Paul on many occasions, and they are helping him now. But we need to make this clear. Paul's joy is not based on the things that he has. He gives the reason for his joy in verse 10. I rejoice in the the Lord greatly. That, he's giving his reason, that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Paul's in prison again. His needs are dependent not on himself. He can't provide. His friends and the broader church must meet the needs that he cannot. The term translated revived in our scripture today is an interesting term. It comes from the world of botany. In the springtime, from winter into spring, we notice something about plants. If you like to plant bulbs in the ground, say tulips, you know that you plant them now and you wait for through the winter season. They lie dormant and in the springtime, they revive. And we see these buds shoot up and eventually flowers blossom. This is a term that Paul is using for the church's concern. It's not as if the church of Philippi was unconcerned. But their concern was dormant like a bud in the ground or like a bulb. Then in the springtime, when the warm rays of the sun hits this plant, it begins to again grow and blossom. Here's the point. The Holy Spirit has been working on that church with the result that their concern revives and blossoms. And they meet the genuine needs that Paul had. Does that ever happen in your life? I have to be honest, there are times when the Holy Spirit moves me to pray for a person, and I have no idea why. And so we stop, and we pray. At other times, there might be a need that you're not necessarily aware, but the Spirit puts it on your heart. What do you do with that? Just kind of throw it aside and say, eh, probably just a fleeting thought. We'll leave that alone. No. At those moments when the Spirit moves on you in that way, when He revives in you concern for another, act on it. That's what the church of Philippi did for Paul. They were willing to help, Paul writes. 
And in fact, the Spirit revived that need in their heart. I want to call your attention to one more issue in the church of Philippi that helps us kind of understand more of the backstory. If we were to go back to Philippians 4 and verse 6, we talked about this a couple weeks back, but I want to go back to it now. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The question is, why would Paul command the church not to be anxious about anything? I believe that he would make this command because the church was in a situation where they were distressed or anxious. You see, it's probable that the Philippian church lacked material things at this point in their life. Perhaps they suffered from poverty. It is probable that in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 2, Paul is writing about the church of Philippi. I want to read that to you. We want you to know, brothers, he's writing again to Corinth, but he's talking about another church, a Macedonian church. Again, the church of Philippi. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that was given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. The church of Philippi was not necessarily wealthy. The church of Philippi was in a situation of need themselves, but they were looking beyond themselves. They were not wealthy, but they were willing to help. It's interesting that Paul does not mention the monetary gift that the Philippians gave him. Instead, he talks about two things. They had concern for him. They had genuine care for him. Sometimes the ability to render aid in a given situation is there, but the opportunity is not. Paul says, you were thinking about me. Again, still in verse 10. And what this demonstrates is that Paul was continually on their minds until finally at last they could help. We spoke of the church's concern for Paul. Next, I want to look at Paul's contentment. This is verse 11. Read with me. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Paul's attitude and his disposition is not, by, is not controlled by a situation dictated by want. Let me say it differently. Paul's attitude is not determined based on what he has or what he doesn't have. If this were the case, then Paul's overall attitude would be determined by things. Let me ask you, how often is the barometer of your own heart dictated by your perception of your own circumstances? You know, it's ironic to me that if you look around the world, the American church is very wealthy. We know this. If you have a toilet that works in your home, by world standards, you're wealthy. But quite often, it's tempting to think that we are the only ones that wrestle with issues of money or wealth, and, and really, nobody else does. I was in East Africa many years back. I was visiting a village I noticed a man who had two goats. He lived next door to a man who had one goat. I talked to both of them. I talked to the person with one goat, and I asked him, what is your greatest aspiration in life? You know, what do you want? And you know what he told me? He looked next door, and he said, I'd love to have two goats. <laughs> <laughs> Contentment. 
Contentment is not a matter of the things that we have. Now, we might say that Paul's being unrealistic in verse 11 when he says, not that I'm speaking of being in need. Now, again, consider the circumstance. He's in prison. Does he have needs? You bet he does. He's not going to eat unless his friends bring him food. But at the same time, he says, now I'm not talking about being in need here. If there's anyone who had legitimate needs... It was Paul. But Paul doesn't want the church to be confused about the fact that his joy is not based on things. If your joy is based on the things that you have or the things that you do not have, then your life would be much like a tiny ship tossed on the ocean of circumstances. When times are good, you're joyful. When they're not, you lack joy. Friends, hold the things of this world very loosely. I think the pandemic has taught us at least that, hasn't it? God's in control. And whatever you have in this world, hold it loosely. Now, we need to say one more thing about Paul's contentment. I need to tell you what it is not. The term that Paul uses for contentment is a philosophical term. It was used by Greek philosophers quite often, specifically Stoics and Cynics. They would use the term contentment to speak of self-contentment, or we could say it differently, self-sufficiency. The Stoics were those who were unmoved by emotions. They argued that Man should be sufficient unto himself for all things and be able by the power of his own will to resist the force of circumstances. Kind of the unmoved person. You ever meet somebody like that? It's interesting to me as well that this same thought process is alive and well in Theravadan Buddhism. Have you run across any Buddhist lately who will say basically this, The things of the world are transient. Now, I would agree with that, but then they go further and they say, I'm unmoved by anything in the world. I just kind of float along in a gray area. I don't want to get my emotions or my hopes too high because I know what happens in life will come crashing down. And I don't want to be that depressed person down here. I just want to kind of live in the emotionless middle ground. Let me tell you a story. Years back, I was on a flight from Phoenix to Los Angeles. It was one of those airlines that had open seating. I know you've all flown in that type of a plane. We had several stops. We stopped off in Phoenix. It was terribly hot. Uh, Many people got off the plane. The plane was practically empty, and then people got back on. I watched as one man entered the plane, and he was dressed in tie-dye from his, basically his toes to the top of his head, and he had a guitar with him. And he walked down the aisle and he opened the overhead bin and he tried to fit his guitar in the overhead bin. Classic scene, you know, movies depict things like this. And it wouldn't fit. The stewardess comes up to him and she says to him very calmly, sir, uh, did you buy a ticket for your guitar? The plane's almost empty. He looks around at all the seats and he says, well, no, I didn't. And he says, I'm just going to put it in the seat next to me. And she said, well, I'm sorry, sir. You need to check your luggage. And I could see that he was getting a little agitated. And he backed up a bit and he said, hey, fine, check it. And he said something like this, all is good. I'm not moved by anything in this world. I'm good, take it. And then he sat down, ironically, in the row right across from me. And I began to talk with him. I said, hey, you handled your situ- th- that uh, situation really well. A lot of poise, a lot of tact. And he began to explain his Buddhist principles to me. And, and I said, well, can I ask you something? He said, yeah. Why are you going to Los Angeles? 
And he told me about his life. He said, well, you know, I've got an ex in Los Angeles, and I'm going there to kind of sort out some child support issues and things like that. And I said, oh, okay. I said, well, did you handle that situation the same way that you handled the stewardess? Because you did really well there. And he said, uh, well, um," and he begins to talk. And he tells me about his whole backstory, and he begins to get extremely animated and emotional and agitated. And I didn't have the heart to tell him at that point that he was not unmoved by emotions as he talked about his ex. You see, there's many people in the world today that are going to travel through this life and they're going to say things like that. I've learned the secret of contentment, and it's this. Just be emotionless. It's not the answer. Stoicism, Buddhism is not the answer. You see, Paul's contentment is not based upon self-sufficiency. It's based on being sufficient in Christ alone. Jesus speaks about our needs in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. He says this, therefore do not be anxious saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is his own trouble. Paul closes his thought process now by speaking about the source of his confidence. We've looked at concern. We've looked at contentment. Finally, confidence. Verses 12 through 13. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who who strengthens me. Paul knows how to be brought low. He knows how to abound. He's speaking in terms of material goods. You see, whether he has excess or whether he doesn't have much at all, His contentment, his confidence is in Christ. In the United States, one of our greatest struggles is the struggle of having an abundance. Again, by world standards, every citizen of our country is wealthy. I'm always shocked when I drive by those who are begging on a street corner in our own city. You know what I see? The same thing you do, stacks of food, fast food, littered on the ground beside them, packs of cigarettes or whatever else that they could want. We have a lot in our country. Every one of us does. We have a great degree of wealth, but we have to treat all of that, all of it, as temporary. The truth is that all of it could go away at a moment's notice. And we have to be willing, friends, to walk away from all of it like that. If we can't walk away from our houses, our cars, our vacations, our businesses, if we can't leave it instantly, then our confidence is not in Christ. I want to read some words from 2 Corinthians 6, verses 3 through 10, as Paul talks about his ministry. He says this, We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Now he's going to talk about the things that are happening. By great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights... Hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet as true, 
as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live, as punish and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. Our problem in the American church often is that we do have a lot of things. The question is, are we possessed by them? Paul gets to the secret of true contentment. He alludes to it in verse 12, and he spells it out specifically in verse 13. Now, as we read verse 13 one more time, I have to tell you, this is, on the top t- this is one of those scriptures that's on my top 10 list. It is one of the top 10 verses that is misquoted in the entire Bible. <laughs> read it with me, and we'll talk about it. I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. How many times have we read that verse on a t-shirt? Seen it on maybe a brick wall at the entrance of a gymnasium? How many times have you heard of a weightlifter pumping himself up? He's going to bench, he's going to set a new record, maxing out today. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And he gets on the bench and, oh, you know. That is not what this verse is about. This verse is also used by Christian psychologists. It's used by businessmen. You know, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Therefore, let's let it, let it ride on this stock. Again, context is king, queen, prime minister, president, context is vitally important here. Paul's been talking about his situation in prison. He's been talking about his financial needs. His secret to navigating all situations is the fact that it is Christ that is giving him strength. The verb strengthen is used throughout Paul's letters to describe the mighty work of Christ in the lives of believers. It's used to talk about Christ's ongoing activity, both in Paul's life and in ours. If we are to have confidence, if we are to have strength, there's a source for that strength. It's not here. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ invigorates Paul Therefore, Paul is able to face any difficulty, including prison. Paul is more than aware of his own weaknesses. The truth is that our human weaknesses demonstrate and point to the power of God. Again, let me read one more scripture. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, this is Paul dealing with his thorn in the flesh. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Friends, as we go about our week this week, as we celebrate, if we are able, Thanksgiving, let us learn to be content in all situations because our contentment is found in Christ alone. The secret of Paul's strength is not in himself. The secret is found in Christ alone. Marcia's going to come and we're going to play our benediction. And after we close, Gene is going to close with our closing prayer today. Thank you.